the Unusual Incidents Unit. The SCP universe has its fair share of secretive, mysterious organizations that operate outside of the control of any single country or government. This includes, of course, the SCP Foundation, the Chaos Insurgency, Marshall, Carter, and Dark, and plenty more. These groups fit the standard trope of shadowy organizations with vast resources that are beholden to no one but themselves. Many countries' officials are aware of the anomalous world in some aspect, however, and some have found it prudent to form their own branches that deal with the paranatural. The Global Occult Coalition works for the United Nations to protect the world from the anomalous, and GRU Division P was formed by the Soviet Union to utilize anomalies to further the USSR's prosperity. It's no surprise at all, then, that the United States would want to get involved as well and it's also no surprise that they're pretty far out of their league. The Unusual Incidents Unit of the Federal Bureau of Investigation is tasked with protecting the United States from paranormal threats, a rather lofty goal in the SCP universe. So, of course, they are underfunded, undertrained, and typically the laughing stock of the anomalous world. We'll be taking a brief look at some of the UIU's operations and some of their interactions with the SCP Foundation. The Unusual Incidents Unit was formed sometime during the Cold War, under the purview of the then-FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, as a direct response to the Soviet's GRU Division P. Hoover set out to get American hands on anomalies before the Soviets could, and their success in this goal was fairly mixed, to say the least. The UIU has largely been a failure for three reasons. First is their lack of funding partly due to being a relatively small branch of the FBI, and due to most officials in the US government not being properly informed on the true danger of the anomalous world. Secondly, members of the UIU generally lack the proper training to handle any sort of dangerous anomaly, and they're occasionally thrown into the deep end of a bad situation without proper gear or knowledge. Finally, the UIU are just little fish in a big pond, and since the Foundation have practically the same goals as the UIU, with vastly superior resources, the UIU are often pathetically redundant. While in the grand scope of things, this typically leads the UIU to be considered a joke by others in the anomalous world, they do at least score points for perseverance, as the US government still has yet to close down the unit entirely. Most members of the UIU are transferred from other departments in the FBI as some sort of punishment for any mistakes they might have made. The UIU is considered a joke position even within the FBI, filled with conspiracy theories and other ridiculous notions. Comparisons with the X-Files abound, of course. During a UIU orientation for new transfers, they're shown an anomalous object a magazine for a Desert Eagle handgun that contains 1,296 rounds. While this does effectively show that anomalous objects do exist, it's a far cry from the true depth of the paranatural world. Other aspects of this world are explained to the transfers, showcasing some of the UIU's unique terminology. Any confirmed artifact, something that doesn't belong within the world, is referred to as a cart whereas confirmed anomalies, anomalous events or areas, are called cans. A can man is a paranormal person, and they're told that others will likely be looking for these individuals as well. The chaos insurgency is referred to as the fireworks, highly trained militia groups sometimes armed with anomalies that swoop in and take or destroy whatever they're after. They sometimes fight each other as there's multiple groups, and UIU members are told not to interfere without backup, as they're better equipped and ruthless. The cart shoppers are Marshall, Carter, and Dark, with the official policy being to raid any known dealers of anomalous artifacts, but to be wary around M, C, and D. The Serpent's Hand are referred to as the Can Collection, known to have very little interest in secrecy. UIU agents are not to confront them in public, and if a Serpent's Hand member gives them an order, they should consider following it, as the member can probably set them on fire with their mind. The Skippers are, of course, the SCP Foundation, known to be well-trained and generally helpful, 
since they have similar goals to the UIU. If the foundation is on the scene, the problem is likely out of the UIU's league. Sometimes the foundation will contact the UIU to deal with something they can't be bothered with, usually a minor artifact, which helps keep the UIU funded. Finally, there are the suits, individuals appearing like stereotypical men in black. It's not clear who exactly these are meant to be, possibly the GOC, or perhaps even higher ranking members of the US government. UIU members are told that if one of the suits gives them an order, they should follow it, but otherwise they're untrustworthy. Let's look at some specific anomalies that the UIU have interacted with. The UIU themselves don't really contain many notable anomalies, so these of course will all be SCP files. Additionally, I'll note that the UIU are not really that popular of a group of interest at this point, so their involvements are often pretty minor. SCP-1514 is a nuclear deterrent system developed by a private corporation alongside the US government in 1983, publicly announced as the Strategic Defense Initiative, and disparagingly known as Star Wars. The system was functional and active for a handful of years throughout the 1980s before its malfunctions and an investigation by the UIU brought it to the Foundation's attention. The first component is a steel device powered by an unknown internal source, with an array of monitoring instruments designed to monitor the state of an entity residing inside of the device. The second set of components are a number of satellites currently in orbit around Earth. Based on the UIU investigation, the satellites contain a red fluid, similar to blood, a lot of wiring, and an interior temperature of 98 degrees Fahrenheit. The wiring seems to congregate on a small, irregularly shaped container, and overall the satellite appears to be a living organism of some type. The satellites are in orbit around Earth powered by an unknown, anomalous source, and although they contain weapon systems designed for disabling intercontinental ballistic missiles, targeting algorithms do exist for ground-based targets. Once every hour, the device containing an entity generates a radio transmission and broadcasts it to the nearest satellite. This transmission cannot be deterred or disrupted in any known way and documentation suggests that if a satellite fails to receive the transmission within 36 hours, all satellites will immediately fire upon their preset land-based targets. The Foundation believes that this would likely be an end-of-the-world scenario. Several components of SCP-1514 were developed through the CIA's Project Montauk during the 1960s, although it's unclear what their original purpose was. A journal of a doctor who worked on Project Montauk gives us a bit of insight on 1514. The work seems to deal with the power of human emotion, and they had been testing a serum on a number of test subjects, all who died. It's the doctor's consensus that the adult human nervous system is too resistant to change, so they're looking to experiment on fetuses instead. The first batch of those tests didn't go well either, with the first two miscarrying so they reduced the dosage. A C-section on the fourth subject was performed successfully, although she regained consciousness afterwards with some messy, expunged results. It seems the carrier was affected by the serum, but not the fetus, so the carrier was placed in a coma. Later, another doctor broke into the baby's room, claiming that he wanted what was his. He had been monitoring the fourth subject over the last two days, and it seems there had been some sort of telepathic event based on the fourth subject's emotions. Aside from that, the project continues to spiral downwards into failure, and it seems as if it's going to be shut down. Things change when the baby begins to emit a form of radiation consistent with telepathic properties. The doctor plans on performing a biopsy on its neural tissue, leading the next journal entry to be completely expunged. Whatever happened led the project moving to a different lab, and the remains of the fourth subject being locked in some sort of casket. The doctor suspects that since the fourth subject could still detect what was happening to its baby when it was locked in its room, he doubts the casket will do much good. The baby is still stable, 
but no more biopsy attempts are planned after they lost half of their staff. The final entry details that the entire project had been a ploy by the Russians so that the US would experiment with something too dangerous. The bond between a mother and child is too strong, and a telepathic mother will dangerously lash out if something tries to hurt her child. The company that had been helping supply the project ended up taking the baby and a sample from the dead mother, as they plan on continuing some of the work. The doctor decides not to tell them that even though the baby's growth is stopped, it will eventually decide to do things on its own. The company of course went on to create SCP-1514 and replicated the cells of the mother, placing them inside of each of the satellites. The baby is inside of the device and telepathically communicates with its mother. While so far it's been content merely sending out a message every hour to its mother, it seems to be developing sentience, and it can't be harmed without the mother retaliating. Sometimes the SCP universe is really weird. SCP-2972 is a parking lot that used to be attached to a Dollar General store in Sebastopol, Mississippi. At some point every 2 to 21 days, an unoccupied motor vehicle parked in the lot will disappear instantaneously. The chosen vehicle is picked seemingly at random, and can include cars, motorcycles, motor scooters, golf carts, semi-trucks, construction equipment, and in one instance, an airboat. At the same moment the vehicle disappears, it, or an identical copy of it, appears in a warehouse in Sebastopol, Crimea. 2972 was first discovered when four consecutive car thefts occurred in the parking lot and after the third, a security camera was installed in the lot by store managers. Surveillance footage showed the fourth vehicle disappearing between video frames, leading a UIU agent embedded in the Mississippi Highway Patrol to investigate. The agent, Titus Solowski, decided to run a sting operation by emptying the lot and parking only a high-value vehicle embedded with a GPS tracker. Five days and seven hours later, the vehicle disappeared, the GPS now tracing it to Crimea. At this point, the UIU brought it to the attention of Interpol and the SCP Foundation, and Solowski assisted in the investigation in Crimea. The warehouse was being run by two men, who were filing off the VINs on the vehicles and selling them on the black market, occasionally getting cash or other valuables from inside. The men claimed that they didn't create the anomaly, but had someone by the name of Penrose set it up for them. Penrose is a mysterious individual involved with some other SCPs, and apparently the identical names of the two cities connected them with a linguistic ley line, making moving things between the two trivial. Solowski scoffs that these two guys discovered that there is effectively magic out there and their first thought was to use it to steal cars. The parking lot was then purchased by a Foundation Shell company, with 40% of the funding provided by the UIU in exchange for the Foundation handling containment. The initial containment procedures involved keeping the parking lot empty, but eventually a car disappeared from a nearby service station. Now, a single car is parked in the lot every 21 days, and a separate team in Crimea retrieves the vehicle. Next, let's look at an SCP that was practically entirely handled by the UIU, SCP-2610. 2610 consists of a family of anomalous humans collectively known as the Colony. The primary four members are all siblings, Simeon, Armand, Yvette, and Jorge born in the first half of the 20th century. Simeon was a medical doctor and self-proclaimed telepath. Armand was a deckhand, and Yvette and Jorge were unemployed. Simeon developed a method of altering the genetic makeup of the group's inbred children so that they would have a significantly shorter gestation period and a rapid rate of growth. As a result, the children carried a high number of physical malformations and abnormalities, along with sharply stunted mental faculties. 
The colony is believed to have been wiped out entirely by U.S. Navy fighters on the order of the UIU in 1971. Simeon was born in 1922 at the West Boston Military Medical Center, and from a young age he expressed a variety of anomalous traits, specifically a self-described telepathy. He describes this ability in a journal entry as being able to see the images and hear the impulses of every person who he reaches out to with his mind. As a child, this was apparently a cacophony, but as he grew older, it became a useful tool. Another journal entry describes an important moment in Simeon's life when he used his ability to enter the consciousness of a lobotomized patient. He was able to see and hear through the patient, looking up at himself. He worries what would happen if he was inside of someone's head like this and they were conscious, so he believes it would be better for a subject to be birthed with no consciousness at all. Armand was also born in the West Boston Military Medical Center, and he is only mentioned once in Simeon's journals. Armand had assaulted an unnamed immigrant woman near the shipyards where he worked, so Simeon had performed a lobotomy on her to cover it up. As for Yvette and Jorge, fraternal twins, there is no evidence of their existence whatsoever aside from references in Simeon's journals and a handful of photographs. In March of 1959, Simeon was arrested on charges of performing illegal medical practices on minors. He settled with the victims for an undisclosed amount and withdrew from the medical field. In 1965, a police report was filed detailing four individuals that were heavily resistant to weapon fire, capable of moving at high speed, and inhumanly strong, who killed three people and escaped with four large trucks filled with cattle feed. They are described as vaguely human, with a number of grotesque physical malformations such as missing or additional limbs, eyes, ears, collapsed rib cages or extruded stomachs, and having large growths across the body. They made no attempts to communicate and brutally murdered the three people before escaping. This brought the attention of the UIU, who began an investigation. Another journal entry from Simeon details an encounter he had with an angel who slipped into his room and entered his body. The angel spoke to him, referring to him as a child of God, and telling him that he has been chosen to lead God's people and create a new Eden. God has provided for him the whore of his deliverance, born of Simeon's blood, and from her womb the earth will be made anew in his image. The angel then gave Simeon a vial of liquid, which presumably allowed him to alter the genetics of his family's offspring. The UIU continue their investigation, detailing another theft of a large amount of livestock feed, with five dead in the process. Responding officers on the scene managed to recover one of the perpetrator's vehicles, recorded as belonging to Armand. During the ensuing chase after the theft, one of the perpetrators leapt onto a pursuing squad car and managed to kill an officer. The driver of the vehicle crashed the car, killing the creature. Another journal entry from Simeon discusses the inbreeding with their sister and how her eyes were also opened by an angel of the Lord. The liquid that the angel gave Simeon ensures a pregnancy, and the effect spreads to the children, allowing the colony to rapidly grow in number. Simeon prepares himself to lead the colony into this new Eden, and prepares for the Lord's arrival. In 1970, the UIU received a tip from some local agents embedded in utility companies that a warehouse was drawing power from nearby lines, despite being abandoned for more than 30 years. Additionally, a car that had been confirmed to have been sold to Simeon was seen at the site. UIU agents launched an operation, initially finding the warehouse empty, but could hear sounds coming from below. They used a lift to descend to the third basement level, and then descended further by stairs. What they encountered is, of course, mostly expunged, but only four out of the 13 agents managed to escape. The surviving agents described seeing hundreds of grotesque humanoids, 
copulating with one another in a mass of flesh. The murdered UIU agents were pulled in and ripped apart in the frenzy. Only one normal human was spotted, identified as Armand. The FBI authorized an attack on the warehouse, demolishing the entire structure, and no remains were recovered. Another journal entry, Simeon describes the continual expansion of the colony, but mentions that his youngest brother, Jorge, is not on board with the colony's activities. Jorge speaks of morality and sin, but the angel came and spoke to Simeon once again, telling them that the Lord desires the sacrifice of one of the four siblings. This, of course, would be Jorge, who will be fed to the colony. In 1971, the UIU were informed that a train carrying animal feed had been attacked and overwhelmed, and the train was now en route to the west coast. It seems that the colony's needs had grown beyond trucks full of food, so the UIU launched an operation to intercept the stolen train. This proved to be pretty difficult, as any attempt by agents to approach the train was repelled by hordes of members of the colony. Using explosives to stop the train was also useless, as colony members would throw themselves onto the bombs. While they were working to stop the train, reports of two more stolen trains were confirmed. While one of them stopped for fuel, over 1,000 colony members swarmed a local high school football game, causing hundreds of casualties. At this point, the UIU realized this was out of their league, and contacted the Foundation. Foundation personnel utilized some anomalous capabilities to disable the colony's ability to communicate with Simeon, resulting in a panic. This panic led to the derailing of one of the stolen trains, and the colony members there were terminated with incendiary teams. Even the Foundation failed to stop the other trains, though, which led to a total of six trains arriving in California where the combined force of the colony overwhelmed the UIU and Foundation teams. An estimated 12,000 humanoids boarded three waiting oil tankers and left into an oncoming storm. The U.S. Coast Guard pursued the ships until the storm proved to be too dangerous, leading the UIU to request Navy jets to bomb the ships. Hits on all three vessels were confirmed. 1,200 entities were pulled from the sea and incinerated, the rest presumed neutralized. Simeon, Armand, and Yvette were never located amongst the wreckage. The case remains open in the UIU. The final journal entry details the arcs that the colony will use to multiply across the earth and spread their seed. Notably, Simeon writes that the colony will spread on four arcs. Very strong sarcic tones with that one, although it isn't explicitly linked to sarcasm. Let's look at one last SCP file, where the UIU stumble upon something much bigger than themselves. This is actually an SCP-001 proposal, titled The Foundation, and is written as a UIU case file, numbered as Confirmed Anomaly 3. The UIU discovered CA-3 in 1954, when students attending a high school reported that the interior of the building was vastly different than it had been in the past. Upon investigation, the UIU noted a number of unusual, if not paranormal, traits. All of the walls in the school had been replaced with steel-reinforced concrete, although several rooms were constructed with completely different materials. All exterior windows had been covered from the inside. All student desks and other educational material was absent, and lockers had been modified to be significantly smaller and constructed of stainless steel. The layout of the building was also quite different, and some rooms would exhibit seemingly random modifications. No fewer than 17 computers were found, each utilizing state-of-the-art RAM. All files on the computers are inaccessible, and the computers themselves are bolted down. The auditorium is inaccessible due to a large steel wall blocking the doorways, which has proven to be impervious. Two teams sent in to do a complete survey of the building went missing. 23 days after initial recovery, 
UIU guards reported hearing a white noise coming from inside the building, seemingly coming from the auditorium. Five hours later, the white noise stopped, but voices could be heard. It was found that CA-3 now contained a large number of people, all wandering aimlessly through the facility. Each individual was physically identical to members of one of the UIU's teams that went missing, despite there being far too many people. No attempts to interview or detain these people were successful. Also, the interior layout had changed significantly again. Three months later, the white noise was heard again, so an investigation was launched immediately. Most of the people inside of the facility had gathered near the doors to the auditorium, and a six-foot circular hole was found in the steel barrier. Shortly after, an object emerged from the hole and was carried off by one of the people to a classroom. This process repeated every three minutes for the next eight hours, with most objects being placed in rooms or lockers. Further investigation revealed that most, if not all of these objects exhibited anomalous properties, and many of the people were either guarding the objects or performing tests on them. It's noted that the people were following standard UIU protocol for handling anomalous items. Two days later, identical armed guards appeared near the entrances to CA-3, preventing any UIU agent from entering. While the UIU was tracking another unrelated anomaly, two men identical to a member of one of the missing teams emerged from a car, detained the anomaly, and drove it straight to CA-3. In 1965, years later, a message was sent from CA-3 on standard UIU communication frequencies. The message claims that it comes from the O5 Council, and they say that it would be nice to be friends. With their superior resources, they will handle containment, and they will be expanding from the original building. The message is somewhat coherent, but is mostly broken English. Eight hours later, another message was received, saying that they have now expanded and are recruiting doctors, guards, and D-men. They're also looking at some international anomalies. It's interesting that they are the O5 Council, and one of the missing UIU teams was designated CA-3-05. Basically, the Foundation itself is an anomaly that started based on the UIU and their operating procedures. Eventually, it grew to eclipse the UIU. And of course, this is just one possible canon, but it's an amusing notion. Despite what I said earlier, you probably noticed that none of these SCP examples display the UIU in a particularly incompetent manner. While there are, of course, plenty of examples where the UIU are little more than bumbling fools played more for humor than competence, these articles show the UIU as capable agents that simply lack the resources and knowledge available to larger groups. As I already mentioned, there are plenty of allusions to the X-Files with the UIU, federal agents thrown into the deep end of a mysterious, esoteric, and frightening underground world. Although it's true that the U.S. government probably doesn't need the UIU in most instances, since the Foundation is capable enough, for now, they're going to keep doing the best that they can.